So yeah, welcome again, uh, everyone, uh, in the virtual room as well as physically at TIPS. Uh, it's really a pleasure to to welcome you uh, for this development dialogue uh, on a very topical issue. I'm my name is Guillaume Sinclair. I'm a senior economist at TIPS. I lead our work around sustainability and, and just transition. And uh, <clears throat> today uh, we're really really pleased to to have quite a, a vast uh, panel of experience uh, to dwell into really one of the optopics of, of the moment uh, around effectively the interplay between climate and trade issues, yeah. uh, or more broadly, environmental sustainability and, and, and climate and development. Uh, and certainly, uh, I think from a, from a personal perspective, uh, this is something that, uh, I've been been working on for quite some time. Uh, life was uh, a way of bringing you back to to some topics. Uh, and I started working on climate and trade issues back in two thousand nine already, um, yeah. when I was actually at, at the United Nations Environment Program. And already then, you know, we we worked on a on a joint UNEP WTO publication on climate and trade, uh, and that was really the first kind of seminal publication. Looking at the interplay between those issues, and already things like the carbon border adjustment mechanism it wasn't called that back then, you know, but it was already a topic of discussion, you know, around you know border carbon adjustments and, and border carbon taxes. Um, so we can imagine that this is a topic that has really been in development for for a while, um, or already at a global level. Already in, in South Africa, I remember uh, jointly with colleagues from DTIC and IDC hosting back in 2013, a similar development dialogue on the risks and threats of green protectionism and of issues related to climate and trade. Needless to say that at the time, um, back in you know, 2013, we were told by the audience this is never going to happen. Uh, uh, what are we smoking? Probably some really good shit. Uh, you know, we are thinking this is coming, but you know, it's never going to happen. Uh, maybe we're a little bit ahead, but certainly ten years, you know, further. Here we are. Uh, here we are, uh, and you know, things like border adjustment mechanisms, border carbon taxes are. And a reality, which is on the doorstep. And of course, you know, the discussions recently have crystallized around uh, the uh, European Union mechanism, known as CBAM. But certainly, uh, I think that CBAM is just the tip of the iceberg. I really you know, uh, respect. Uh, certainly. From an EU perspective, uh, it is only one of the Main policies uh, that the EU is looking to implement. Um, we see that as part of the UK Green Deal, you know, and policies around circular economy, around you know, automotive, uh, around agriculture, uh, and, and, and energy more broadly. And also, of course, other jurisdictions, the UK, the US, you now with their Prove It Act, um, but also Japan and, and other are also looking. Are implementing you know, CBAM like uh, mechanisms. And so, in many respects, you know, this is going to be part of the landscape going forward that we want it or not, that we like it or not. And I think it then really raises the question in terms of how do we react as a country, but more broadly, you know, from a global south perspective, uh, it is really imperative to understand what is the kind of space to operate. Um, mostly those measures are now being considered by countries and jurisdictions from the global north, and that has implications more broadly uh, for the countries in the global south and the space to develop, trade, and, and operate going forward. So without further ado, uh, we'll jump in uh, our uh, our event today um, will manage both you know, 
physically and uh, and digitally uh, when it comes to raise questions and comments. Uh, so, I mean, obviously in the room, we'll just take it live uh, digitally. Please feel free to raise your hand or to write your questions or comments in the chat, and then we'll uh, we'll pick on them uh, as uh, as we go. We'll start with two um, inputs, um, looking at the global south and then Africa uh, specifically, before we move into a bit more of a, a, a panel discussion. So I'm very pleased to, to introduce our, our first uh, our first speaker, um, Max uh, Grunet. I was a senior uh, policy advisor at uh, E3G uh, in their uh, Washington office, focusing on US and EU climate diplomacy in a global context. And he's recently uh, authored a paper looking at a new fair deal for climate, trade, and development opportunities for the global stars. So we're really uh, happy uh, to uh, have Max with us today uh, and uh, you can share a few thoughts um, going forward. Uh, Max, uh, welcome again, uh, over to you. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for inviting me today. So I, um, if I don't feel entirely fresh, I'm, I'm talking to you uh, from the United States. So it's a little bit early here still. Um, so bear with me. I'm going to keep my uh, opening remarks or input uh, relatively brief, but uh, absolutely happy to then join also in the discussion, answer questions and engage. And um, CBAM to me is also not an, an extremely um, recent topic. And uh, I think it's it's uh, surprising the amount of, um, well, if you call it progress that's been made in this field, but it's really happening. And this is, that's really coming and it's not just in one country, as Gaylor said. So it's really an issue to confront. And um, as with many tools, it can be, it can have positive and negative outcomes um, for, of course, different people. It can uh, have different impacts. So today, I want to take a step back and um, look at the more my my view on how we should look at these intersections of climate trade and development and um the the first thing i notice is and i assume most people will agree with me that there is not enough clean tech and climate investment going into countries of the global south uh, especially not coming uh enough from the global north and so at the same time, people in the high income countries in uh, OECD and other groupings, they sometimes you get the feeling that they think that this is um, not an issue for them, um, that that's a problem for the others. But my thinking is that exactly it's a problem for them because their wealth and prosperity is building on this interconnected ecosystem of nations. And so they can only remain in their favorable positions if they uh, lead or conduce uh, a drastic betterment for the global South. So this is my, my premise, so to speak, my, my uh, hypothesis that uh, only sharing prosperity will generate prosperity. Um, there might be short-term gains, of course, going your own way, but in the um, medium term and longer term, we all need each other more than ever before. And uh, that will only increase because of the impacts of climate change, of course. Um, so this, New fair deal that you mentioned before, so it's, it does not exist yet, but the idea is to link um, separate policy fields and especially, especially climate trade and development to create deals across these three dimensions and 
um, geographies. And this deal would then no longer require one-on-one -on -one matches, meaning we don't need to have a trade deal with a trade deal. The agreement would not have to be trade on trade, but we could have climate on trade. We could have climate on trade on development. We could have deals between various partners where each party has specific aspects in it and not all the same. So in a sense, it's adding complexity. And uh, definitely also the challenge of the big question, if, if uh, and maybe people want to ask questions later, like where do you want to discuss this, right? Because there's no real forum for this kind of cross um, policy and cross geography conversation. I just recently listened to Pascal Lamy and I don't wanna put myself in, and say that I'm speaking on the same level as Pascal Lamy, absolutely not, but he suggested something actually not entirely different. And he suggested, well, maybe it's the G20, but of course we've just seen how difficult it is to make progress within the G20. And of course the G20 is also, as the name says, only, only the G20 so far, right? So it's not, going broader, plus uh, it has a focus on the finance minister side. Anyway, um, so the idea of this be deal would be to open these new doors to new opportunities that create benefits without making any party in these deals worse off. So this is kind of the the condition for this to work is that at the very least, people have to stay on their benefit level. Um, but ideally, of course, everybody wins something through these deals. And um, I said in the beginning that there's not enough money going um, in, meaning investment um, um, into the global south. And, risk or factors um, being barriers for this are manifold. So there's quite a few and I don't wanna take up too much time, but of course, one big uh, factor is currency risk um, and how we deal with these risks currently. It's also too expensive, too detrimental, lack of access to technology, lack of access to skills for clean tech, industries and climate tech. And so, um, and, and of course there are also others. And here I wanna say like um, trade restrictions, right? Including um, tariffs, but also non-tariff barriers, of course. So it's a, it's a wide field. And here we come back to the CBAM discussion is this um, um, impeding trade, right? Um, and steps that we, recommend or that the research I did recommends is go into many different fields from debt relief for climate, um, from creating regional guarantee platforms for enabling investment and um, trade, but also offering preferential rates for clean tech exports and imports and investments and uh, other trade access privileges in, uh, in exchange for climate action, which, and you can hear this already in this, this requires also WTO reforms or at least um, changes in WTO rules. So this is a very important longer term part. And then of course, what we can do now already uh, without WTO reform it are things like a, a clean tech intellectual property bank, a green bank for patents, so to speak, but also clean tech knowledge hubs. These are all options where we can share this um, prosperity of the new clean tech era. And um, to summarize, we need more openness less closed doors. And this goes back to the question of the CBAM, right? So is the CBAM um, offering any of these offers of these open doors in exchange? I have a few questions regarding the carbon border adjustment mechanism. And I think 
they haven't been really answered and some of them have been semi answered but in a different world setting um meaning a couple of years ago when they did these impact assessments which was of course before the war in ukraine um and was in a different price and trade environment uh, altogether. But an important question is, of course, when we look, what's the goal? What's the objective? And what's the net outcome um, in terms of global climate benefit? Do we actually cut global emissions with this tool? Yes or no? Or do we achieve something else? So that's then also the question of adequacy. Is this the right tool for the right objective? And um, if we go more in detail into it, what about circumvention? Uh, and that links actually to the climate impact. Do we actually set the right incentives for exporters or on the other side, importers to um, drive climate production or clean tech production up, cleaner steel, cleaner cement, um, or is it just a reshuffling, right? So in just very simple terms, does it just mean that from country A exporting into country B, um, the exporters in country A will just pool all their low greenhouse gas emission intensity products into country B, to lower their payments, but net the effect is zero because the dirtier materials go to other countries instead. And then also the big question, and that links back to my open door question, how does the EU CBAM fit into a global approach to sharing prosperity and opportunity and global climate action? Basically, what's the narrative that the EU or other people who propose a CBAM want to tell the world here. And then also, and maybe I'm very transactional here, but where's the deal in this? So at this point, it's a one-sided affair. And that's also part of the problem in the EU. It's considered a domestic policy and it's not considered a trade policy. So there is no, um, bilateral aspect to it, no multilateral aspect to it. And this is, of course, a real challenge because in our global economy and in global climate action, we need to consider the impacts on and with others. And that's why I think this meeting here today is so valuable too. And um, Dialogue is the very first step here um, to reach solutions and make progress. So I think we need a space where we can bring these debates on climate, trade, and development um, together in a constructive way and achieve progress across all three dimensions and not unilaterally. So that's uh, that's that's my my uh, to kick off this um, round here, and I'm I'm very happy to go more into CBAM technicalities um, if if um, if and when desired, including also of course, and you mentioned this, the U.S. versions where they uh, are drafting, which is totally not a law yet, but where there are proposals on the table, indeed. So, but uh, I think for starters, maybe that that's um, a moment to kick it off and I'll listen to the others. Thank you. Great, thanks for you. Thanks so much, Mike, for this uh, initial input. I mean, really perfect to, to set the scene uh, in terms of, I think the broad debates that, uh, that you know, mechanisms like you know, kind of trigger and put on the table. And so I think that was really, uh, really, really useful. And, we, before we jump into uh, you know, questions, uh, we're going to take our, our second input. So you know, hold off on those, maybe just uh, you know, let them down uh, if you're online into the chat or uh, if you're in the room, uh, give, them, give them Andy. And I want to introduce uh, a TIPS colleague, a TIPS economist, uh, Sir Tame. Um, um, 
who has been working on those issues now for quite some time and uh, looking at uh, particularly the impact of, of CBAM on, on South Africa, um, but also now uh, looking more specifically at the impact of uh, CBAM and the EU Green Deal uh, on the African continent. And so we're looking forward to Sertamin's input uh, to share uh, some of the insights. Uh, so, Terry, uh, over to you. Uh, thank, thanks, Gino, for also for uh, this kind of line. So, um, so with CBAM, so there's a lot of um, work that we've been doing in terms, especially you know, covering the, the impact of CBAM in the African continent. So, um, um, so I've you know highlighted this CBAM as a challenge and opportunity for the African continent, and I will show you briefly now what that means by then. But you know, generally. Um, there has been, you know, back in 2019, you know, the EU introduced what they call the European Green Deal. So it's a you know policy package of different packages there. So there's the CEM, there's also other sectors, for example, the sectors such as uh, policies such as the deforestation uh, regulation, so focusing more on other goods. But you know, for the for today's dialogue, I'm just gonna only focus on CEM. So as part of that policy package, the you know the main intent of the, the policy package is to reduce total GHG emissions of the European uh, Union. So with them, you know, um, aim to uh, streamline you know the climate action across uh, across the globe. So and within that policy package, there is what we call CBAM, the, uh, the carbon border adjustment mechanism. So and the main intent of um, that policy is to you know, as we study, you know, the mechanism is that, you know, our uh, main intent is to raise revenue. So that revenue is going to be raised later on, we channel back into the EU coffers to, uh, you know, fund the climate issues and decarbonization in the, in the EU. And, and of course, to promote climate action abroad and prevent what they call carbon leakage, right? So, uh, of course, you know, carbon leakage, you know, as Max have already highlighted, you know, earlier on here. So we also mentioned issues about circumvention. So within the, the, the carbon leakage you know, uh, space, we see we just like to see that the African continent or the global south countries are gonna be the playground in terms of uh, carbon leakage because we're gonna start seeing a lot of uh, you know many EU firms or firms in developed countries moving into uh, jurisdictions that have lesser you know climate change policies because you know it's gonna be easier and even you know, cheaper for them to produce some of these sectors. And, and as part of that, the CBAM mechanism they have included, initially there were a lot of sectors, so they cut some sectors, they cut uh, plastics and, and organic chemicals, but then they included a lot more uh, sectors. So some of the other sectors, and with the recent you know, uh, legislative piece of CBAM, they've included iron ore, which initially it wasn't included as part of the, the, uh, the products there. So it, you know, it, it broadens as, as it goes, and as we we start to see that uh, but there are sectors. So some of the additional sectors that we do there, there were 29, you know, um, products released across sectors such as you know electricity, cement, uh, fertilizers. There was iron ore, um, iron and steel and aluminium. So across those, that's what the initial list of CBAM. And now with uh, the legislative piece, they are. You know, the number goes up from the 9 to 32 products that are covered under uh, the mechanism. So, and within those products, um, CBAM requires, um, you know, in the, you know, there are two phases in, in, in the implementation of CBAM. And in the first phase, they would require the, you know, accounting of both direct and indirect emissions. And as you can see from the screen here, that, uh, for example, electricity, cement, fertilizers, and iron ore. Will require you know accounting of uh, both indirect and direct GHG emissions. So of course there are a lot of opportunities and challenges that come with accounting of both indirect and direct emissions in some of the sectors. And looking at the iron, steel, hydrogen, aluminium, and articles of iron steel, they all require you know uh, reporting or accounting for direct GHG emissions. So within this context, you start to see that you know later on. There will be some infrastructural issues and some of the opportunities that comes with you know, accounting both for GHG emissions and 
um, you know, direct and indirect missions. So if I go to the next slide, I just want to give you uh, a high overview of, you know, the, the, the phase of implementing CDM. So there are two phases there. So the first phase, which will start um, um, this year, the 1st of October. So and you'll see that mostly, uh, you know, the, the mandate of uh, the, the, the transitional phase is only focusing more on accounting and reporting of GHG emissions. And from the previous slide, you saw that, you know, the, there are certain sectors that, you know, will be required to report on the GHG. Uh, GHG emissions are both direct and indirect emissions. Uh, some of the sectors that I think you have already mentioned to them. Then later on, from 2023 moving forward, um, towards the end of 2025, um, so what will happen is that um, uh, the European Commission has to say that they will do a full assessment, right, in terms of making sure that, uh, for example, some of the sectors that were not included earlier on can be included in terms of preparing for full implementation of CDM. Uh, we should start from 2026 going onwards. And from 2026, that's when we'll start to see um, a lot of, um, you know, sectors being included in the in the CBIM. And, and later on, we, we will see, you know, as, as you know, that the first phase is not going to be focusing more on, you know, paying the, the carbon water tax. So the second phase, which is the implementation phase, is going to be focusing more on buying what they call CBIM certificates. And later on, you know, under the EU emission trading system, then they're gonna, you know, uh, freeze out what they call free allocation under the system. So, and and you know, going forward, then some sectors will be included in, in that space. So, within that context, um, you know, um, we've been doing a lot of research trying to analyze the impact in the African continent. But the next slide just tries to give you a picture of. Um, you know, from the recent paper that we, we've been doing, you know, as much as you see some of the numbers being small, some might consider them small because we only look at CBIM here, but looking at the broader context, looking at the European Green Deal and considering other, you know, jurisdictions that consider, uh, for example, CBIM like measures, and for example, we've seen in Japan and the US and the likes that try to uh, introduce, you know, CBIM. So the cost that you see on the screen here is going to be, you know, more. But from our initial uh, assessment, we, we've we seen that in the African continent, so about 7.3 billion, um, you know, US dollars of African exports are at risk because of, uh, you know, introduction of uh, CBIM. And some of those, you know, sectors that will be heavily impacted are mainly in the iron steel and fertilizers. And in the next slides, I will show you what, you know, how, you know, you know, for example, what are the countries that will be heavily impacted within the iron steel and fertilizers and, you know, um, and the electricity and as well as, uh, you know, a cement space. But hydrogen, you know, uh, Africa doesn't export hydrogen to the EU. So this is just some initial results that we got from, from the study. And we, you know, from, from this uh, study, we see that uh, the cost is, you know, the cost that we see here is just the minimum cost that we have to uh, in, in terms of you know trying to access the European market and other markets that might consider introducing such mechanisms. Um, so we just have the next slide or just you know from here. Um, so I've tried to bring across some of the other countries that will be impacted. Of course, you know these are not all the African countries, so I had to cut the list because you know it couldn't fit on the slide. But from here, you can see, um, again, so iron steel, aluminum, and fertilizers are some of the products that will be, or sectors that will be heavily impacted in the African continent that you see from, you know, across the, you know, these two figures here. So they present the vulnerability in terms of GDP and as well as total exports. And from here, what you see, you know, and, you know a lot of people have been also talking about this will be going to be heavily impacted. And so we see that Mozambique, um, Egypt, uh, South Africa, uh, as well as Morocco, so North African countries, and you know South, you know South and African countries, especially South Africa, Mozambique, are going to be heavily impacted by uh, the, the introduction of 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 CBIM and CBIM like measures. But of course, you know uh, the picture changes in time if you look at the European Green Deal as a whole, because it includes, for example, agricultural products. There's also um, 
and we're specifically looking at you know uh, East African regions that will be impacted by the deforestation regulation. But within this context, you know, looking at Zika, so these are the countries that will be impacted. So if you look at I'm still there, so the I'm still is you know um you know under the Zika list. So they've included uh, you know iron law and articles of iron still of course all those they don't fall in the same category but you know in this case we just you know uh, categorize them for to simplify the analysis but you know this is just a, a big picture of how some of these African countries will be impacted by the introduction of Sweden. So I know that there is a lot of research that has already been done in this space, but of course you know the research that has already been done has been done before the state legislation was adopted in May um, this year. So this is just a build up of some of the work that I think everyone else has already been doing in the space. Um, so the next slide. Yeah, but the next slide it looks at uh, you know the, the issues, right? So uh, you know the, uh, some of the issues I think Max has already mentioned them and I think some of the panelists here are uh, going to actually expand on this. But uh, looking at some of the issues that arise from the research and some of the um, engagements that we've had, especially in the student space, is that there are some you know five critical issues that comes across with the implementation of introduction of CEDAW. So um, of course the first one that comes to mind is that you know we know in the African continent, South Africa is the you know is one of the only countries that have carbon price in place, and other you know African countries don't have that. And, the CEDAM um, requires um, jurisdictions to have at least some sort of you know, carbon infrastructure in place to, um, for example, report or even pay for the GHG emissions in that space. So in the African continent, with the absence of you know, carbon taxes or carbon prices, so we know that we're going to be paying a lot of uh, you know, carbon tax you know, from the United States going onwards into the European Union, right? So in, in that, you know, uh, case we know that that's a big issue for us because a lot of money is going to be going out of the continent going to, to the EU and, and also speaking of infrastructural issues you know there's uh, in the short term especially during the transition period there's um you know most of our economies or exporting firms are required to actually have uh, what they call the monitoring reporting and verifying systems to account for the GHG emissions that goes into the production of, for example, iron steel or, or aluminium. And, you know, of course, you know that most firms don't have some of those infrastructure in place, and it's considered one of the most expensive infrastructure that, uh, you know, CBAM is actually introducing, especially to firms and, you know, our economies across the world. So um, some of the other issues that also arises from the introduction of CBAM, so and some of these issues have already been, you know, um, talked about despite, you know, the interlinkages between time and change and trade, but WTO issues and previously um, the African group and I think people in the global south have actually been raising complaints to the WTO about uh, the fairness of the, the multilateral system. And for example, we've seen over time now that they, there's increase in what they call the green protectionism. And right? within that space, and we know that you know the introduction of Sydney is that. Uh, a uh, unilateral measure and it violates some of the other WTO issues. But the one that comes to mind here is that uh, with the EU introducing CBAM, so they're using carbon price, right? So the carbon border to discriminate against, uh, you know, the uh, domestic and foreign suppliers. And it's one of the other violations in the WTO. You know, um, I think some of the colleagues here that works, you know, um, you know, very close to the WTO might actually expand on some of those issues. And of course, um, some of the other issues that comes here, which are able to introduce to decrease, uh, you know, global, you know, greenhouse gas emissions. There is a lot of climate change issues that arise from that, especially the continent. We know that the uh, African continent contributes less than 30 percent of, you know, total, you know, GHG emissions. And with the introduction of this, you know, there's a, we start to see that, you know, uh, the EU is, is, is uh, with the intent of creating a level playing field, we start to see that the climate responsibility that, you know, they need to take um, into account, they actually shift the climate change responsibility to the continent or to, to the global south countries. 
So that's you know um, a big issue, and it might be some of the other issues. You know, one of the principles of the UNFCCC, which they call common but differentiated responsibility. So we know that you know developing countries or global south countries haven't you know uh, historically contributed to total change generations, and their responsibility should be differentiated in that case. And with the introduction of CEDAW, we actually um, undermine some of those principles highlighted in the UNFCCC. And of course, carbon leakage has already been um, mentioned in, in this case. I'm not going to just um, spend much time explaining that. Yeah, so the, the, the last slide, so uh, just focusing more on the, some of the solutions that might uh, you might consider in terms of um, trying to go you know, trying to mitigate the, the, the impacts that CBM is having in the African continent. So um, so some of the other, you know, responses, and I think first of all, what we need to do is that we need to start responding. We know that in, you know, recently, um, CBM, you know, published uh, you know, what they call the Implementation Act of CBM for commentary. And in the African, the entire African continent, there were only two submissions, one from the DTIC, in terms of uh, raising some of these concerns into, into the EU. So what we need to do is that we need to familiar, familiarize ourselves with the, you know, the regulations and highlight some of the um, issues that come with it so that we can have a better understanding of the, the, the tool and later on negotiate or even engage the EU or other you know, um, parties involved in, you know, um, in, in the implementation of the of the rule of the regulation. So um, but in, in the short term, I think some of these you know recommendations that might consider long term or short term, but some of the you know recommendations to be considered is that we know that South Africa is the only country in the African continent that has carbon pricing. And you know it's gonna be an opportunity for the South African for South African firms to leverage that to pay a lesser um, carbon, you know, it, what they call CBM certificate. So they're gonna have, you know, an opportunity there, but most other African countries are not gonna have that opportunity. So within that context, we know that Botswana, Senegal, and others are considering to have, you know, introducing carbon pricing as also a mechanism for, you know, reducing or, you know, uh, GHG emissions in, in their industries. But within that context, we know that the carbon pricing can actually be used to, for example, you know, uh, be taxed domestically, then later on, we're gonna get uh, some sort of a rebate in terms of, you know, for example, if you're gonna export something to the EU, then you're not gonna pay the full price, then you're gonna pay uh, maybe the shortfall that comes with, for example, what you pay, then what you're gonna be paying in the EU. So with the introduction of, you know, um, you know, carbon pricing in the entire continent, there's a lot of opportunities there. And one of the opportunities that there will be some funds that will be raised in the process of, you know, having a carbon um, price in place, which will lead to you know, some of the issues that we, we actually currently facing, for example, climate change, loss and damages, and, and then the likes. We can actually use and leverage the, the carbon pricing to finance some of those issues, you know, climate change issues that come to that. And of course, we decarbonize some of these industries that you know, um, we were talking about here. Um, so just to, to, to touch on the last one, so the other ones, I'm not gonna touch them. So I'm just gonna you know, highlight the last point here, which, I think speaks to the WTO issues. So, and, and here we, we, we know that we can start leveraging uh, the ministerial conferences, the uh, ministerial conferences that are happening at WTO. So the first one coming in next year, Feb, so we can leverage that, you know, um, in engagement to raise some of the other, you know, concerns that comes from the global south or the African continent. And so, and of course, in 2025, they're gonna be, uh, you know, um, one of the MC, it's going to be, you know, a uh, post in Cameroon, which I think we can leverage that as an African continent to raise some of our issues that comes from the introduction of CBM. Not only just CBM, but you know, some of the other, you know, global climate change policies that are introduced everywhere else. So, and you know, I'm not going to touch back. I think there was um, and now I'm just saying now here. Yeah. All right, that's my time. Uh, so yeah, I think within that note, I think maybe. You know, uh, with the other, you know, uh, panelists that will, I think, expand more on this uh, and talk more. Thanks. Well, thanks so much, Sir Tami. I think that was uh, uh, put some numbers to, to your question. I think it's always useful. Um, I think that's really great. Um, 
before we jump into uh, our next inputs and um, a bit more uh, interactive discussion, just want to see if there are any kind of questions for clarity uh, on the on the two on the two initial uh, inputs that uh, that we've had. Um, nothing in the room. Uh, nothing in the room. Um, I think on online there are a couple of couple of questions. Uh, I just want to see. Um, I guess one of one of the question was uh, what's the what's the link with carbon pricing? So um, we know that uh, there could be a potential to avoid CPM, uh potentially uh, if countries have, have a carbon price. Uh, so I think this someone wants to, wants to know, but uh, I guess a bit of clarification <laughs> around that. Of what's the relationship between domestic carbon pricing and then uh, and then CBAM? Um, there was another question uh, in the chat around what's the ability to for an industry to protect themselves. So you know, if we take a country like, for example, in the case of South Africa, if you link ESCOM, I mean. You know, uh, depending on what your industry is, you know, there's probably not much you can do. Um, so, are you going to be impacted or not? Um, and then I think the one question, and maybe we will see if uh, some of the other panelists can answer, is a bit of an elephant in the room, but uh, is is CBAM going to stand uh, WTO compliance? I guess uh, no one really knows that until it goes through it, but, uh, but I think, you know, um, Maybe if you have any any thought on on those three uh, or either, and uh, that would be that would be good. Uh, very Max, do you want to just uh, start to give it a shot? Yeah, on the WTO question, which is of course very very interesting, because um, the Europeans they just say yes, of course it's um, totally compliant. Because we're not discriminating, um, it's, it's, it's been said in the chat, it's about leveling the playing field. So it's just a cost correction, so to speak, to compensate for a disadvantage that European companies uh, are exposed to if they're produced domestically in the EU. And um, and the thinking there is that it's going to be a phase out. Currently, these sectors benefit uh, widely, except for electricity from free allocations. So the free allocations will phase out and um, the non-free, so the paid for allocations will phase up over time from 26 on to 34. And then, and then uh, correspondingly, the, the share that importers have to pay for um, or cover in CBAM certificates will increase. So, so this makes it sound very fair. But of course, the counter argument is for one, it really is blind to any other climate policy. So it only looks at the carbon price as a climate policy tool. And if you want to have, um, you know, if you if you want to claim, for example, exemptions under Article 20 of the GATT, then, then it's about uh, protecting uh, the environment and humans. Then, then, of course, any policy that achieves climate protection would be justified. And so this is an interesting question here, how this will be Done. And of course, technically speaking, looking only at the price is the only feasible way because once you open what you could call Pandora's box, if you want to look at all possible climate policies, that's a very wide field. And that's exactly what the, what the Americans are trying to do, um, basically squaring the circle in a way without a domestic carbon price still having an import fee on greenhouse gas emissions in products or embedded carbon in products. So this is, this is a very, very good question. And as you said, with WTO um, litigation, we will only know once this is ruled. So this is impossible to predict which way this will go. And um, the good thing for the Europeans is that this litigation process, if it then happens, 
takes many, many years. So it's not going to happen anytime soon. So they can do this. Um, the Europeans, and has to be said, they're the first movers. So this is both uh, bold and somebody has to go first and they will definitely also have a lot of learning costs there. Others can watch and observe and learn and be better. And um, that's of course good too. And the Europeans have done it before. If you think about, for example, um, solar power or wind power, they were first movers and they paved the way in a way. So you can say, okay, that's good. But of course, the question is at what cost to others? And Sir Thomas said this very well, that there are indeed sectors and countries in, in Africa, and of course, beyond Africa too, that will be uh, potentially negatively affected. Um, so, so that's just um, maybe for starters on the WTO question, that's the main debate uh, outside of Europe, but it links back to this whole question, which also went through the chat. Why didn't the Europeans engage early on? Why was it not done more in, in uh, dialogues and consultations with uh, their trade partners? And the background for that is indeed that they consider a domestic policy um, and not an, a trade policy tool. Uh, even though it has uh, undeniably has trade applications. Um, I, I hope this um, added some clarity. Of course, I don't know what, uh, what the final ruling will be on WTO compatibility. Of course, at the same time, we have discussions about reforms to WTO uh, rules and um, the trade regime. So the WTO, you might have seen this, is trying to actually map these um, um, uh, trade and climate initiatives. And there's been a lot of pushback against that too. And um, it's of course, the big question is, can the WTO basically become the front runner or the, the place where these um, different initiatives can exchange and can uh, align and can uh, be standardized in a way, maybe even. So that's still totally out there. Um, at the moment, it's not happening, but maybe if we're optimistic, this can happen. Uh, next February is the next WTO. Um, meeting. So this will be very interesting to see if they can make progress in that regard. Great. Thanks so much uh, for that, Max. Uh, really, really helpful as well. Um, yeah, I think uh, just, I think it's a bit to it briefly, but I think it's, uh, it's also interesting. Yeah, if you have the time, you know, uh, so there was a comment period on the traditional uh, uh, period, uh, and they were 187 comments submitted to the EU. It's all online on the EU website. Uh, some are very short, but some are really substantive. Um, and uh, I mean, I really recommend going through at least some of them. I think it's quite uh, quite instructive. Uh, most are from European countries, but actually they are quite a number from countries from, from the global south, including, as uh, Jeremy said, uh, from the South African uh, Department of Trade Industry and Competition. Um, but Jeremy, I don't know if we got any. Uh... I think the other, if you know, there's no time. I think the other people might come in here and answer. Okay. Okay. Um, you want to question? Yeah, I'm concerned. Okay. Maybe I uh, raise it to you. We can uh, address it in the panel. Maybe so. Uh, what's yeah? You can go ahead. I can go ahead. Okay. Uh, so my question is. Um, Maybe just introduce yourself as well. So hi, I'm Hadu Patel. So I'm a, I'm a senior economist here at as well. And my question is around uh, the EU stance. So um, is it clear from the EU's position that um, the funds that are raised through this sort of mechanism would not be uh, channeled in any way to support? decarbonization in developing countries. So is it is it clear from the EU that um, these funds will be retained within uh, within the EU for, for their decarbonization goals? I guess is the first question. And the second one is, does the would, would the EU care if uh, say countries with more deeper pockets 
in the interim period while they're developing their decarbonization uh, strategies, subsidize their domestic industries uh, in lieu of the, of the potential uh, 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 punitive trade measures that we're going to face. Yeah, so that's all my question. Cool. Thanks a lot, Marvin. I think we can hopefully address those in the in the in the panel discussion. And um, so I think let's you know move swiftly to to that. Uh, and uh, we've got two uh, two more uh, experts. Uh, we're going to bring their own perspective, which we're really looking forward to to hearing from. And uh, so let's. Uh, Go next to uh, uh, Prof. Uh, David Luke, uh, who's a professor in practice and strategic director of the Heroes uh, Levy Institute for Africa at LSE. And he recently uh, led a team that uh, authored a really interesting paper on the implications for African countries of CBAM. And uh, I'm sure you'll share some thoughts on that, but also more broadly on the, on the discussion. Uh, Prof. Uh, Pleasure to have you. Uh, welcome. Over to you. Great. Um, thank you very much, uh, Gelo, and uh, hello to everyone. Um, like um, I'm screwing, um, um, I'm speaking to you from the US. I'm actually in Boston. So it's um, something like 6.30 in the, uh, approaching 6.30 in the morning here. I'm normally based in London, but I happen to be in Boston uh, this week. Um, so, you know, I've been um, trying to keep awake and uh, follow the uh, follow the discussions. Um, I've been asked to uh, look specifically at the issue of what should be Africa's uh, response to the CBAM. I'm going to try to avoid uh, repeating what has been said, but I'll you know sort of try to nuance a few points that have already been made and 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 so on. And here I would suggest that there are at least um, six. Uh, um, areas of response that um, Africa could, uh, uh, African countries could, um, uh, could, could follow up on. Um, and I'll try to um, outline these uh, six um, uh, areas. Um, the first one, of course, is uh, diplomatic pressure and consultation. Um, uh, as we already heard from Max Goering, uh, the CBAM is uh, considered by the EU as an internal uh, policy uh, issue. So um, in that uh, context, um, uh, obviously African countries uh, can use um, diplomatic channels to uh, make their concerns known and, and so on. This is already happening, um, I have to say. I'll just give one example. I saw um, uh, uh, a note, a diplomatic note that was made public by the um, South African Department of uh, Trade, Industry and Competition, the DTIC, uh, that's dated uh, 11th of uh, July. Uh, that was sent to the EU uh, office in in uh, in South Africa. And basically, uh, I'll just quote um, uh, uh, just a couple of sentences from it. And um, the uh, diplomatic note says um, the CBAM has the effect of transferring the burden of climate action onto developing economies and places on new and unjust burdens on our country economy. Uh, on our country economies. Um, around 1 billion exports of South Africa to the EU are at risk, um, uh, end of quote. And then the diplomatic note goes on to say that um, special provisions have not been made for least developed countries uh, and so on. So I think uh, all this is, is happening. Um, countries are uh, making representations to the EU as one area of uh, response. I think the ante on this could be stepped up. The, there is scope for the African Union to uh, get engaged on, on this issue as, as well, um, because obviously there's strength in, in numbers. Um, but, you know, in any case, behind the scenes, um, you know, this kind of um, discussion is, is going on. And um, I would not at this stage want to prejudge what could be the outcome of uh, these representations that are being made to the EU. Um, a second area is um, legal challenge. Of course, uh, the WTO, which already you've been, um, uh, we've been discussing uh, this morning. I'll just add a couple of uh, points. Um, our study, which Gela referred to, that looked into this issue, was not, uh, you know, came to the conclusion that it's not clear cut uh, what could be the um, outcome of a, of a legal challenge. Um, again, because uh, the EU sees it as an internal. Uh, issue. And because it is, as has been pointed out, it is phasing out um, 
the free allowance is allowed under its own ETS at the same time that um, uh, it is phasing in the the CBAM. Um, you know, there's a good case could that could the EU could make to say that this is not uh, uh, discriminatory. Uh, you've already heard uh, about um, uh, the uh, you know difficulties in applying um, GATT Article 20 to this. Um, GATT Article 21 has not been mentioned, which is the national security exception. That's another uh, possibility. And the views that um, if you look at the WTO jurisprudence, uh, starting with the shrimp uh, turtle case, that um, again, the outcome of all of this is, is not clear, uh, clear cut. Um, and then, of course, the appellate body is not functioning. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, so and, and as you've heard, in any event, uh, all of this could take quite some time uh, to be uh, resolved. So. Um, uh, whilst, of course, uh, African countries could align themselves with uh, India and others that are uh, considering a challenge and, and so on, um, this does not look really a very promising route at this uh, point in time, but nonetheless, it's, an, it's a second area of response as we've been uh, discussing. Now, a third area, which perhaps might be much more promising, again, you know, this has been touched on, is on, um, again, the issue of finance for the clean energy transition, and also um, provisions on technology uh, transfer uh, to support um, adaptation. But here, perhaps uh, it could be nuanced a bit uh, uh, to say that um, there is scope really to target the specific sectors that the CBAM is um, uh, CBAM uh, affects. So uh, I think there's scope for prioritization. And, and again, this is a point that we make in a, in a study that um, uh, has uh, you know, issues around finance, um, as around um, technology transfer, technology know-how and so on uh, being pursued, that you can actually try to prioritize uh, uh, these key sectors uh, that um, are high emitters um and 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 to see you know what uh, kind of support could be uh, uh, garnered on, on on this um here also i'd like to make um, a point which perhaps um, the next speaker after me uh, kekaletso who is at the south african mission in the wto might also want to come in on and that is actually uh, the african group at the wto has been uh, stepping up the ante on this issue of te technology uh, transfer, but clearly more work needs to be done in this area, the modalities, the specifics, and I think there's a lot to um, uh, unpack um, as to exactly what um, uh, technology transfer would entail. I noted uh, um, uh, Max talked about the Clean Tech Bank. Um, that certainly could be one of the modalities uh, going forward. But um, I think, um, you know, this is an area where obviously African countries have a strong interest and it's one that they should be uh, pursuing. Um, then next, uh, another area uh, would be um, a voluntary carbon credit market uh, that could generate resources, again, to support the climate uh, transition. Um, the issue here is to scale up uh, credit for Africa's uh, nature-based assets that help to mitigate the impact of um, carbon uh, emissions. Um, so there's a growing market uh, for this as uh, companies uh, try to purchase uh, carbon credits, etc. cetera. <clears throat> um, transparency and all that is, is a challenge at the moment uh, around these uh, sorts of uh, issues. Um, the, you know, the, the COP27, uh, a new outfit was launched, the African Carbon Markets uh, Initiative. Um, but, you know, I think uh, this, again, is an important area and uh, crucially, it could help to generate uh, resources uh, that could be used in the clean energy uh, uh, transition. So I, I think this is promising. It's at, uh, still at, um, uh, at the low stage uh, of development. Um, a major challenge is how you set a fair price for uh, carbon in, in Africa and, and, and so on. So lots of issues still to be worked out, but nonetheless, it's a promising uh, area. Um, the next, um, yes, uh, it's already been mentioned. Um, there is uh, the possibility of African countries setting up um, their own compliance um, 
carbon emission trading uh, schemes. Uh, Sutumale has already talked about this and identified a number of countries that seem to be going down that route, like Botswana, Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, Morocco, and and, and so on. So um, yes, this is um, uh, another possibility. I think um, it's cumbersome for African countries as a whole uh, across the continent. Uh, I think many will struggle with, uh, uh, you know, managing uh, uh, effectively uh, a carbon trading uh, scheme. Um, uh, I think also uh, we have seen uh, on the trade facilitation side, uh, you know, the sort of difficulties many countries still have with the reforms and and so on. But, you know, nonetheless, it's an option. Um, and uh, again, it will be uh, interesting to see how this evolves. My own fear is that going down this route will divert attention from the clean energy transition itself, which is where I think uh, African countries need to be. The investments required for this and um, also the issues relating to tech uh, transfer uh, tech know-how and, and so on. So I think it could be a diversion. Um, and I think um, there'll be more benefits to begin by focusing on on, on investment, uh, focusing on, on the technological issues and so on. So um, my final area that I would identify is, um, again, this has been touched on, is that the link between trade and sustainability need to be strengthened. Um, you know, yes, indeed. Uh, uh, there's uh, a lot of discussion going on right now as uh, how best to do this, uh, taking note that the next COP will have uh, one day devoted to trade. Um, increasingly also at the WTO, um, the number of uh, entry points for uh, discussions on trade and sustainability. But I think the point is, is now clear, whether it's the G20 or <laughs> wherever, uh, I think the point is now clear that um, you can no longer approach uh, sustainability issues in a silo without taking account of trade, because as, as uh, Gelo himself said at the beginning, um, you know, these issues are here to stay. It's now a question of how we um, uh, try to uh, manage them and and, and not. So I think I'll, I'll stop here. Um, but um, in terms of looking, uh, you know, at African responses, I think these are uh, some of the options, of course, they're not mutually exclusive, but um, I think this is now where the, uh, you know, the, the new uh, uh, policy terrain uh, in terms of the uh, uh, responses that uh, uh, could be made. So let, let me stop here. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Prof. I think for uh, you know, really highlighting those kind of key areas, which I think is, as I said, not mutually exclusive, and I think we need to start thinking a little bit outside the box as well. So I think it's really great uh to to put that on the table and we can we can delve deeper into into it as well um i want to i want to now just jump to uh, uh to our, our next input uh you've already uh introduced briefly um but uh okay and so much uh, is uh Geneva, uh as the south african permanent mission to wto uh, so you can see we're really uh, harnessing the potential of uh, the hybrid uh, you know, uh, workshops today. Uh, we've got representations from uh, various continents at this point. Uh, so really happy to to get uh, to get some some insight from someone who's really at the uh, at the coal face in Geneva dealing with those issues uh, from uh, from a South African perspective. Really pleased to to have uh, you with us, Kurtkevitso. Uh, uh, over to you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you both to TIPS and to the DTIC for organizing um, this event, this event, which I think is, is very timely. And um, just to kick off, I think uh, for the sake of time, I think I'd just say that uh, my brief was um, basically to speak on positioning the global south in the WTO. Um, but um, I'm going to pivot somewhat um, and go beyond the global south to positioning Africa in the WTO. And this is essentially because um, as the global south, we engage the WTO um, not only um, as individual members, but also as the Africa group, noting the challenge of climate change and the environment um, are not necessarily located in any one country or region, but require um, a regional, uh, global African solidarity. 
if they are to be addressed um, in a balanced and sustainable manner. And um, I'm not really going to speak to the concerns regarding the CBAM. I think these have been well articulated by previous panelists, so I will not dwell on them. Um, and then to go on to, to, to my brief, um, I'll start off by saying the Africa Group has positioned itself at the WTO to address these issues. And noting um, the slide seven of Saudi's presentation in terms of how Africa can respond. So um, I'll expand on it. And um, basically um, say that um, in terms of positioning the global South and Africa as a whole in the WTO, the Africa Group has started um, firstly by acknowledging the importance of climate change. Um, and the climate agenda. But the Africa group is equally concerned uh, by the growing trend of using um, unilateral um, trade measures to pursue um, environment and climate goals, some of which um, go beyond national borders and have extraterritorial reach. For example, your CBAM or the deforestation regulation that has been introduced by the EU. So to this extent, um, the Africa group has been proactive in raising its concerns at the WTO at various levels, at the General Council and also in the various committees where climate issues arise. And um, to this extent, the Africa Group has developed a paper which has actually been formally submitted to the WTO General Council. And as we speak, I actually had to step out of the General Council because um, um, I had to participate in, in this webinar, but the Africa Group is actually tabling this paper at the General Council this afternoon. And basically this paper will serve as a, as a reference point um, in addressing um, trade and environment issues. And for the Africa Group, um, it's also um, a reference point for purposes of promoting a policy dialogue amongst members. It also serves as a document to enhance transparency on the various unilateral measures that countries are taking. It's a paper that serves to identify gaps that have been identified by developing countries and to essentially address the interface between trade, environment, um, and climate change, and sustainable development, uh, with the aim essentially of ensuring that all trade and environment um, measures are geared towards a sustainable development framework. Secondly, in terms of positioning itself, um, the Africa Group is following a holistic, um, development-oriented, and inclusive approach when it comes to discussions on trade. Um, and climate change and environment. And the essential purpose of this is to ensure that there's an understanding of the complex relationship between trade, environment, and sustainable development, while at the same time taking into account uh, developing country interests and challenges. Because essentially for the Africa Group, um, it's not just about protection of the environment, but um, it's about protection of the environment in a manner that also takes into account the unintended consequences of environmental measures on trade, um, the global economy, and also recognizes the interests of and needs of, of developing countries. To this extent, in terms of um, the developmental approach, what the Africa Group has done is um, basically um, underscored the fact that the Committee on Trade and Environment, where issues like CBAM um, are, are discussed, um, focuses on placing sustainable development at the core of, of, of its mandate. And what the Africa Group has also sought to do is ensure that the Committee on Trade and Environment um, refers to its mandate and its work program. Because currently discussions that are taking place in the committee are actually beyond the mandate of the committee. Um, it's basically your plurilateral discussions fo focusing on, on plastics, on fuels, which are not necessarily in the mandate and work program of, of, of the CTE. And what we've also called for is that the Committee on Trade and Environment should invigorate the necessary political will amongst WTO members to discuss the more difficult environmental issues that affect developing countries. And these discussions need to take place um, in a manner that fits um, developing countries' needs and priorities. And this includes that discussions must take place in a sustainable development framework that would better suit um, the long-term interests and needs of, of developing countries. Thirdly, um, in terms of positioning itself, what the Africa Group has done is develop guiding principles in terms of 
how um, the Africa Group would want to see such engagements taking place within in the WTO. Noting that um, climate change um, can only be addressed effectively through global cooperation or rather through global competition. And um, this essentially has meant um, the Africa Group outlining elements of what it would regard as a global deal that would allow um, effective and inclusive action. And this means that um, requiring a model that would enable all countries and regions to develop the necessary mitigation and adaptation capabilities within the resources that they have. To this extent, um, the Africa Group has developed key principles that should underpin the developmental approach and that should guide discussions at the WTO and the interface between trade and environment. And these basically um, uh, are elements and principles that speak to the CPDR principle that is um, underscored by the UNFCCC, principles that speak to special and differential treatment, access to transfer of technology, adequate, appropriate, and fit for purpose technical assistance and capacity building, and also ensuring that companies that do operate in various um, countries. Um, do so um, with responsible business conduct. So these are some of the principles. I haven't enumerated all of them. And basically what the principles are supposed to do is serve as a basis for engagement um, within the WTO. And the objective is to ensure that discussions within the WTO when it comes to trade and environment ensure a better understanding of the relationship between trade, environment, sustainable development, and that there's also um, a better understanding of what the linkage is and the role is of international trade um, and, and, and um, how international trade um, can, uh, can contribute to such a discussion. It's also about ensuring that um, the climate agenda um, and environment um, not constitute arbitrary and disguised restrictions or unjustifiable discrimination in international trade. And, um, creating competitive disadvantages for developing countries is also to ensure that um, climate and environmental measures um, are not used as justifications for technical barriers to trade, and also ensuring that members don't shift the responsibility of meeting their own nationally determined contributions to other members. Essentially, that developed countries don't shift their responsibilities to developing countries. And then fourthly, in terms of positioning itself, um, the Africa Group um, has sought to ensure that any discussions that take place at the WTO are multilateral discussions um, and not um, unilateral discussions or plurilateral discussions ge geared towards unilateral and arbitrary um, environmental measures. The Africa Group has also short, sought to ensure that the WTO engages on, on areas of interest and important to developing countries, given the fact that environmental policies um, are evolving rapid, rapidly and uh, particularly um, in the developed world, and um, environmental requirements are increasing at a rapid pace, and these will eventually increasingly affect um, developing country market access significantly. Additionally, um, linked to this um, is that the Africa Group is trying to ensure that um, adaptation of objectives and green uh, uh, financing um, are issues that um, are actually discussed um, because developing countries lack the funds to cope with adaptation needs, um, yet it's developing countries that are paying the price. So develop, developing countries need to ensure that there is uh, predictable and accessible climate financing. So climate mitigation ambitions need to be supported by financial adaptation ambitions. There needs to be a correlation. And then also with regards to capacity building and technical assistance, um, what the Africa Group seeks to see is strengthened, adequate, and fit for purpose um, capacity building and technical assistance that will be able to ensure that developing countries and least developing countries are able to meet the incremental obligations and the rising costs um, from global environmental issues um, and to ensure to build um, resilient um, economies. And then lastly, um, in terms of positioning itself, um, the Africa Group um, has looked at um, industrialization. 
Um, given the fact that the Africa group needs um, to address its longstanding developmental challenge, um, which is reducing its dependence on the production and export of primary products and moving up the value chain through industrialization. And I think this applies equally to the current um, accelerating transition to a lower carbon economy. Because um, while there are opportunities that have been identified for the Africa group to supply mineral products that will be used um, in greening technologies or, or using the abundant sunlight that Africa has um, as a potential competitive advantage in producing green hydrogen. It's equally important that the Africa group um, deploys um, active industrial policy to pr promote higher value added um, opportunities. So to this extent, what the Africa group has done is um, in addition to a tabling um, a paper on principles of engagement in terms of trade and environment um, in the WTO. It also tabled a series of papers at the WTO um, calling for discussions on policy space for industrialization and rebalancing trade rules on the basis and understanding that the WTO also has a key role to play in ensuring that um, economic and industrial development um, opportunities that are associated with green transition actually do contribute to the structural um, transformation of developing countries and um, their structural position in global production and supply networks. So more specifically, um, there are a number of WTO agreements that um, the Africa Group has looked at in this um, respect um, in terms of rebalancing and recalibrating trade rules in a manner that ensures structural transformation, diversification and identification. More specifically at the moment, um, we've looked at the terms agreement, we've looked at the agreement and subsidies and countervailing measures, and we've looked at the TRIPS agreement. In terms of the TRIP, in terms of TRIMS, um, we've looked at issues around local content, which are important for industrial policy. And we've made a case for developing countries to have access to similar policy tools that developed countries used um, in their industrial development which are, are no longer uh, um, accessible in terms of trims because they are prohibited by trims. So we want a revisit of, of the agreement and an updating of the agreement to ensure that it speaks to current times. In terms of the agreement of um, subsidies and countervailing measures, um, here we speak to issues on subsidies, which we see as a tool for put, um, for industrialization and economic development. And we've basically called for um, a revisiting of policy space that has expired under that agreement, and also a revisiting of certain thresholds, such as definitions um, of actionable um, subsidies. This in the context of addressing the current challenges like climate change. And then with respect to the TRIPS agreement and matters related to um, technology transfer, we see these um, as a potential enabler for technology transfer to support sustainable industrialization. So in that paper, what we've done is we've sought to explore the link between TRIPS agreement and technology transfer and the benefits of enhancing um, productivity, um, whether in agriculture and industry, um, to ensure that the sustainable industrialization and to also address um, climate change and the need to also develop effective mechanisms uh, to promote um, transfer of, of, of technology. And last but not least, um, although this is not taking place within the WTO, um, there's a link um, um, between the WTO and the AFCTA, which is the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. And I mentioned this given the fact that um, the Africa group at, of, at WTO is composed of 44 African countries. And all these African countries are signatories to the AFCTA. Um, so I think it's important that the Africa group sees how best to harness the new energy um, from the Africa, um, African Free Continental Trade Agreement, um, because policies to decarbonize trade um, are gaining ground in the AFCTA. So we need to see how the AFCTA can help um, Africa face and address the challenges that um, it is dealing with. Um, I think the AFCTA can be a powerful resource, not just for integrating Africa, but also for um, establishing a, a number of commonalities for meeting um, the changing prerequisites for engagement um, in terms of regional 
um, global value change and, and climate change itself. Yes, it will be a very expensive transition to new energy infrastructure, but needless to say, it's something that, that we need to do. And I think um, as African countries, we need to have um, a pragmatic approach in terms of how we address CBAM and other unilateral measures. Because in as much as we raise our issues and raise our challenges, and um, I'm not necessarily happy with the unilateral measures that are taking place, um, developed countries are going to implement those measures. So it doesn't help for us to sit and not do anything. We need to um, face the challenge um, and, and decide as an Afri as Africa group how we will um, deal with these challenges, both pragmatically and also, um, I guess, in, in a policy manner in terms of in, in terms of the WTO. But we need to know that the measures will come into place, and we need to be ready to ensure that there is um, there will be less of an effect in terms of our exports and productions um, um, to the EU. And thank you, Chair. Great. No, thanks so much, uh, so for very comprehensive insight as well. And it's really great to see what the Africa Group is uh, yeah. is doing. And uh, I think you know this is great to see that the group is being very proactive. And there was, I think, there was a question in the in the chat, and I think that's probably a question that many of us are, are wondering: are, are any of the submissions uh, available? Are they are they public? Or are they accessible in some ways? Um, yeah, it would be great for I think for them to be made available if possible. Uh, so I don't know if that's something that's that's available. Sorry, pardon me. Can you repeat that? I missed that. I just wanted to, we wanted to know if the other submissions from uh, the Africa Group uh, or the papers that you've mentioned are they are they available publicly? Yes. It's available publicly now because it has been tabled at the, at the General Council. All these documents have been tabled at the General Council. Okay. In fact, the, the, the main um, um, uh, document on um, guidelines on, on um, principles in terms of um, engagement um, on trade and environmental issues is currently being tabled this afternoon at, at the WTO. The other documents that speak to industrialization, um, the trims, um, the uh, ASCM um, transfer of technology documents, all those um, have also been tabled at the WTO and, and are available. Okay, well, that's great. And I think we'll probably just liaise with you separately to just know where to find them and we can share because I see a lot of people in the chat are interested in those, those submissions. Um, I want to see if there are. Questions, uh, comments from, from the room, uh, online as well. Uh, I'll ask you to keep it this brief. Uh, remember to introduce yourself. Uh, Mohamed, you got the end and then I got one there. Yeah, Mohamed. Yeah, so, <coughs> so yes. <coughs> so speak in my... No, just speak up. Oh, okay. So, hi, Mohamed Patel again. Uh, I hope I'm not asking too many questions, but it's a quick one. So, um, you know what is the what is the process from here? So once these uh, reports are tabled, how is the uh, how is the decision then reached, and how long does that decision take? Uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. I think we'll take that from over there and look at as well. Brian, earlier, just uh, so the first part is just the six elements. Is the second phase then to what is the scope to other products? Is that the ultimate end? Okay, thank you for that. So, uh, what is the scope of the product? Uh, and then, yeah. um, when you only hear from TUT, um, for me, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a reflection uh, point to say the challenges that we see from the CBAM point to the ideological challenges in our approach to the climate crisis. So once the crisis is framed as, a, as an Anthropocene crisis, which is just a generalization of how humanity has impacted the global environment, um, and we are not specific to what the real elephant in the room is, which is capital, um, that informs the direction we're taking trying to tackle this. And as you can see clearly from 
and the tenants of the, of the CBA end, how do you maybe be getting the raw end of the stick? So maybe the question would be, are we in any efforts that we've discussed here, also addressing the ideological problematic that undergirds this general approach to, to the climate crisis? Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, we'll take one more. Um, you know, I just wanted to ask, what role do we think the financial services can play to enhance these, these dialogues? The role of the financial services, okay. Cool, so well, yeah, thanks for, for those. Uh, I don't know if there's any hands online. I don't see any at this point. So I think we'll just uh, throw it back to, to our panel. Um, and maybe you can just, you know, as we draw to, to close, reflect on some of those issues and, and, and also potential others that we, that we brought in before. Um, there were certainly some other questions in terms of the recycling of the phones as well. Uh, that we asked in terms of what's envisaged from the EU perspective. Um, of course, the broader question in terms of countries also subsidizing uh, their industry. You know, I think we certainly see what's happening in the US, for instance. Uh, it's, it's a different approach, but the impact might well be very similar in terms of competitiveness. Uh, when it comes to, to the global south. Uh, and then just to repeat some of the, the questions, maybe in case you didn't hear them, role of financial services in addressing the question. Uh, I think what's the plan in terms of the expansion of CBAM, uh, in terms of, you know, I think that ties in in terms of what's the process from here, um, in terms of the rollout. And then I guess uh, some of the broader debates around uh, how we go about uh, Addressing those issues, you know, that again, I think it ties into is that the right tool, uh, given the current system that we work in, uh, or not? So I think we'll uh, we'll give uh, each of our uh, panelists an opportunity to kind of wrap up. Uh, you can bear with us for a few more minutes, uh, starting maybe with with Max, uh, and just uh, some some last thought from from your end, some last reflections. Yeah, thank you. I'll uh, try to cover some of it, but I don't think I, I can I can answer it all. Uh, the scope of products, that's a very good question because of course, from a from a theoretical perspective, you would like a CBAM to cover every product uh, indiscriminately because otherwise you have um, definitely distortions to, to the market, right? Because you price certain products, but not others. If you look at steel, for example, the, the steel as an, as an unfinished product, as a primary good, as they say, is, is part of CBAM. But if you transform it into a car, it's not. So if you, if you make a car out of the steel in South Africa and sell it to Europe, you're no longer covered. And of course, this, uh, in, in theory, once the price signal is strong enough, will lead to shifts and, and, and um, shifts in the trade flows and manufacturing that can actually backfire technically. The question about the subsidies in, in, uh, in the context of the CBAM is interesting because we talk about carbon pricing, but of course, these subsidies can be uh, seen as negative pricing, basically. So uh, while Europe has an ETS positive price on carbon, it also has a negative price on carbon by providing certain support measures for clean tech. And the US even more so has no price on carbon, but just um, the subsidies. So this um, makes it very interesting from how, what do you consider as in, in, as when you look at the um, total um, system, what's your system boundaries basically. And that leads to the question, is this the right tool? I mean, that's of course a very subjective question, but I think what we need is more cooperation, not less. And I think the basic thinking behind the carbon border adjustment mechanism is a thinking of scarcity and competition and not of cooperation. So I think at this moment in time, we need a more generous approach, an open trade approach. And we need to think more in terms of partnerships than in terms of uh, competing against each other. 
And um, I will leave it there to give others room to speak as well. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Max. Uh, is that all right? Uh, uh, thank, thanks, Gator. So, um, so I think I'm just going to touch base on some of the other questions that we've already been raised as well. So um, just to expand on, I think, on the scope of products covered on the CBIM. So uh, earlier on, I mentioned that the CBIM is part of you know, um, what they call the European Green Deal. So the European Green Deal you know, covers almost all the sectors. So transport is included there. You know, um, chemicals are also included. You know, agricultural products are also included in, in that mechanism there. So uh, I think as much as we haven't done a lot of research in you know, trying to understand the impact, especially from other um, regulations, especially earlier on, I had a little bit uh, there is uh, what they call the deforestation free regulation, which focuses more on uh, agricultural products. So specifically looking at you know, our <laughs> concords and, and, and the like. So within that concept, what, what we see is that uh, the scope is not only, you know, scope of products not only coming from sebum, but it goes beyond sebum. So including other sectors as I've already mentioned now. So, um, and again, so in terms of the, the revenue, so I think, you know, Mohammed, you know, uh, I like the you know, question about what is the stand of the EU in terms of, you know, using the, the, the funds that will be collected, you know, in the process of implementing CBIM. So I think that's a good question. Right. So, um, so in the meantime, I think, we, you know, researchers have already been highlighting that, you know, some of those funds, you know, can be leveraged to, for example, in the fund, you know, um, capacity building initiatives to ensure that, you know, some of the firms that will be exporting into the EU or already exporting to the EU can be trained in terms of using some of those, you know, the system in place, because we know that the system is already here to stay as since they've already, you know, legislated that, uh, you know, the mechanism. So, you know, developing countries or global South countries can, you know, leverage that. I know that in the CBAM legislation, there is, um, you know, uh, an opportunity, you know, they highlight that, you know, um, there might be some talks or some engagement with the global south countries to engage more on, you know, how, you know, for example, the EU can support the global south in terms of, you know, utilizing, you know, CPM for their, you know, for their development and in general for, you know, um, access to the European market. So I think some of those questions, I think I will just touch those two. Then allow others to also be great. Thanks so much, uh, Satami. Uh, Prof, over to you. Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, from my side, um, I think what I'd like to emphasize is uh, in closing is uh, the need for coherence um, on the African side on how they want to approach um, trade and uh, sustainability. Um, as you've heard, a uh, number of initiatives uh, that are going on at the WTO. Um, uh, which uh, the African group has been very active. Um, but then also at the level of the capitals, we are also seeing um, other uh, initiatives, including those that are going, wanting to go down the route of um, developing their own um, uh, emissions trading schemes and, and, and so on, which may be premature in the light of what is also happening um, uh, uh, globally. Um, then, of course, the COP process, the um, UNFCCC uh, process uh, needs to be aligned uh, with other measures that are being uh, taken. Um, the AU now is, uh, is, is, is getting a seat at the G20. I think there is a consensus on that. And I think that needs to be used uh, effectively again uh, to ensure coherence. Uh, the on the finance side, uh, you know, both multilaterally and bilaterally. Um, again, the issues here that uh, require better coordination among the uh, among African uh, countries. So, my own last word on all of this is: uh, there's so much is going on, many players, different parts, uh, but um, I, there's obviously need for coherence. Um, if all of this is to make an impact, and, and that would be my parting uh, my parting message. Great. No, thanks for that. Thanks for that. Uh, great. And then, uh, yeah, you've got uh, the last word. Yes, thanks. I think um, specifically with regards to the question in terms of where to from here, um, I think it's also, it's also important to note that even though we've um, submitted these papers as, as the Africa Group, um, the WTO is a negotiating forum. 
So the fact that we've submitted these papers um, as the Africa group and this is what we want and we desire does not mean that this is what we'll get. So now is the time to basically start engaging both um, at the WTO multilaterally, but also bilaterally with, with the various um, individual members at the WTO. Now that the paper has been tabled at the General Council, it's also going to be tabled, um, these various papers are also going to be tabled at the various respective committees. So for instance, the TRIMS paper is also going to be tabled in the TRIMS committee. The um, agreement on subsidies and countervailing will be um, um, tabled in the Trade Remedy Committee. Technology paper um, tabled at the Technology um, um, Committee. And um, WTO members will then engage, will gauge on, on these issues. We have put forward um, our challenges, our interests, the need for policy space, but that is always something that needs to be negotiated. And in terms of time frame, unfortunately, um, I cannot tell you how long it will take because I say these, these are um, negotiations and, and it's always give and take. So I think for now, that is um, as best as, as, as I can answer it. And then um, I think I'd also just like to touch base on um, the issue that I think um, also I was earlier in terms of um, the legality of, of CBAM. I think um, for me, um, with regards to um, the legality of CBAM, I think um, my assessment is that um, it's not a clear cut issue. Some would argue um, that um, there is non-compliance with the CBAM. Others would argue that there is compliance with the CBAM. And I think um, my view is that um, the relationship between the, um, the various um, legal um, provisions um, and exceptions in the WTO agreements um, and countries' commitments on climate change um, and the Paris Agreement um, are complex issues and all have to be taken on board. Um, with respect to the WTO agreements, um, there are specific uh, um, provisions in the various agreements, in your TBT agreement, um, your SPS agreement, your subsidies agreement, your general GATT agreement, all those provisions would have to come into play when one has to um, test the legality of, of CBAM. And um, added to that, one also needs to remember that there's no specific um, rules in the WTO that govern trade and environment. So there's no a priori um, inconsistency with respect to taking measures to address climate change, but there are general rules, rights and obligations that WTO members have to comply with. And then the issue becomes when you introduce your measure, is it um, in line with um, the rights and obligations um, in the various WTO agreements? And I think that's where the issue of consistency or inconsistency um, arises. And um, I think, um, as alluded to earlier, um, some members may want to um, initiate a dispute at the WTO, but one also has to take into account the current dysfunctionality of the WTO system. The appellate body level is not functional. So should a member win a dispute at the WTO, it may in all probability be appealed into the void. But I think more broadly, I think, um, there's um, just growing acknowledgement um, that the CBAM and, and um, other um, recent um, environmental laws and regulations are going to weigh heavily on, on the WTO um, dispute settlement system. And as I said earlier, it, it's already a fragile system, given the fact that the second layer is not in place. So um, border measures, as well as I think various incentives that countries um, are introducing um, by electric cars or solar panels, um, that also include um, significant domestic content uh, requirements might be targeted by other WTO members at, as trade distorting, as unilateral, um, and may be challenged at the WTO. Um, and I think the same can be said for industrial policy steps, including um, domestic semiconductor production. So I think these are all issues that countries need to consider when they actually want to initiate um, a dispute at, at the WTO. So I think Countries have been hesitant because um, it's not really clear cut. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for that. Uh, yeah, so uh, I think that was a perfect way to, to draw us to a close. I uh, really want to thank uh, 
Thank you everyone for taking part. Thank you to, to our, our panelists, uh, particularly uh, you know, for joining us so early, uh, uh, Max and, and David. Uh, we'll let you get back to breakfast. Um, you know, we really appreciate uh, all that's joining us online. Uh, it's really great to see so many friends in the room as well um, and, uh, and to make the hybrid work. I think we really are. There's the potential today of that. We'll share uh, with you the, the recording, of course, uh, the PowerPoint from Sertame, the papers from Max, as well as uh, David, and then uh, the Africa Group submissions, once we had a chance to locate them. Uh, we'll share all that uh, with, with everyone. Uh, we look forward to carrying on the discussion. Uh, as you heard it today, it's uh, only through discussion and dialogue that we're going to get around this. So we uh, keep the door open. Look forward to carrying on uh, you know, the dialogue. Thank you again, uh, and have a good day further. Uh, and then until next time, keep well. Thank you.